In this session, we're going to explore the core concepts that relate to technologies education. So as part of this, we're going to look at a range of thinking skills. We're going to look at critical and creative thinking, as we find in the general capabilities. Um, we're going to look at the three main aspects of thinking skills in technology education, um, systems thinking, design thinking, and next week we'll be specifically focusing on computational thinking. And then we also have a range of other associated thinking approaches, such as project management, collaboration, entrepreneurship, which I frame as strategic thinking, and looking at preferred futures as a focus of the technologies learning area, which involves aspects of futures thinking. So we're going to examine a range of these different thinking skills and how they can be developed through technologies education. So these are mental processes. They're ways of seeing the world and thinking about the world that help us solve problems, uh, make decisions, ask questions, construct plans, evaluate ideas, organize information, and create things. So they allow us to do stuff. Now, in Bloom's taxonomy, which is a, a way of um, approaching various um, aspects of knowledge and learning, they have lower order um, thinking skills and higher order thinking skills. The lower order ones are things such as remembering and understanding. And then we have higher order thinking skills, such as critical thinking, analysis, evaluation, creativity, and problem solving, which are the ones we're focusing on um, in this session. So as I said, we've got those various approaches to thinking skills that we explore through technologies education. Now, project-based learning is particularly useful in developing these thinking skills. Of course, it is very much focused on the attempt, the process involved in developing projects rather than on the outcome. And the learning occurs in doing the project rather than on the outcome of the project. Um, and students have got lots of opportunities to be innovative and creative, and this can lead to some really great opportunities for them um, to start their own companies to become to make breakthroughs in technologies in medicine start social movements these all involve higher order thinking skills and that's what we're looking to develop in our students so the first of these is critical and creative thinking and this really relates to project-based learning and problem solving at its intersection so critical thinking involves things such as imagining, inventing, changing, designing, creating. And critical thinking involves analyzing, breaking down, comparing, listing, sequencing, and ranking. And between those, intersecting those two thinking approaches, we have problem solving, where we're trying to improve on things, design new approaches to doing things, refining existing approaches, combining different ways of doing things, inventing new ways of doing things. And in the curriculum, we have the general capability of critical and creative thinking. Now, it's around getting students to be able to imagine and generate and iterate and evaluate ideas, um, use abstraction, which we're going to explore in detail next week, and solve challenging problems, problems that are really difficult, um, and looking at ways of thinking about how to solve those problems, and also involving the use of technology to assist us in solving those problems. So this is again focused around creating those preferred futures, having the skills and capabilities to make the world as we want it to be, but also looking at how we might impact upon others and how these decisions might impact upon ourselves, all so that we can create a better designed and managed world. Now, part of this is communicating our ideas and our designs, and we can use drawings and models and experiments and designs to visually and spatially represent these. And you've been doing some of that already, creating 3D models, um, articulating inf information through infographics, things where we have to communicate our ideas so that people can understand our designs, so that we can implement them. Okay, so the first of the creative and critical and creative thinking skills is around inquiring. This is about students being able to develop questions and to be able to identify, process, and evaluate information. 
So in developing questions, we both need to be able to narrow our understanding in terms of the question and also expand it. So we narrow it in terms of breaking it down and understanding what makes up the question, what it really means, what are the elements of the question. But we also need to expand our understanding of the question, how it relates to other questions, how it relates to the wider world, how it relates to larger contexts. So it's really about being able to develop good questions that help us creatively and critically understand the world better in answering those questions. But we also need to be able to think about information and identify, process and evaluate information, particularly in this world of fake news and misinformation. Students being able to understand the sources of information and how different information can have different value that we place on that, depending upon the trust we place in the sources of that information. Then we need to be able to generate, um, create possibilities, consider alternatives, and put our ideas into actions. So do stuff. Now, in terms of creating possibilities, some of the most creative ways is combining existing ways of doing things, existing ideas, taking an existing way of, um, say, transport, uh, existing way of getting from one place to another, getting to school, and combining it, say, with entertainment options, um, being able to show movies on the school bus, um, which may help reduce uh, bullying on the bus. Um, combining different ideas together can often be a very creative process. But also coming up with imaginative new ideas is an important aspect of creating possibilities. And we're going to look at some ways students can do that. Considering alternatives is an important aspect. Some students get a very blinkered way of seeing the world, that everything happens because of external forces. But there are always different, different ways of approaching things. Nothing always has to go one way. There can be many different ways things eventuate. And students need to understand that and consider, okay, it might go that way, it might go this way. What are the options and benefits and what's the preferred way that things should go. Then we have to put our ideas into actions. We have to experiment with our ideas, modify and adapt them and evaluate them. Look at different options and the results of them and see how they might perform in different circumstances. And again, we're going to explore that further in design thinking. Then we have to also be able to analyze. And this involves three aspects being able to interpret concepts and problems, draw conclusions and provide reasons for those conclusions, and evaluate actions and their outcomes. So part of interpreting uh, interpret concepts and problems, we need to be able to deconstruct them, break them down and understand them in much greater detail by understanding the various elements of these concepts and problems. We need to be able to um, make decisions and make conclusions and justify these through argument. And that's a skill students need to develop. They can't just say, I want to do it this way because I want to do it this way. They have to make justified reasons. Why do they want to make their paper plain this way? Let's say they're making it as a group. If they want to argue for it to be made in a particular way, they have to justify their reasoning. Um, and that's a skill they need to develop. And then they need to evaluate and consider what could be the outcomes. If I make my paper plain with this approach, um, what might happen? Maybe it'll be more dangerous if we have a sharp point at the end. Uh, maybe if we add too much weight to it or make too many modifications and add too much to it, it won't be able to fly as far because it'll be too heavy. These are things that need to be considered and evaluated in terms of their potential future actions. Then we have reflecting. This is the last component of critical and creative thinking. Thinking about their own thinking and also being able to transfer what they have learnt to other domains. So metacognition is understanding our own thinking um, and being able to reflect upon that and understand that other students may have different ways of thinking, have different viewpoints on an issue. Now, this becomes particularly evident when we have issues that can be controversial. Um, let's take a simple one, though, for young children. 
um, their preferred food. Um, let's say preferred pizza. Some students may love Hawaiian pizza with pineapple and ham on it. Other students may hate the idea of having pineapple on their pizza. Some love anchovies, some hate anchovies. So understanding that we can have different viewpoints and that that's okay and that the world has differences, that not everyone is going to see the world as you see it. And that's becomes a really important part when we look at collaboration, how we work together on things. And the other part is being able to transfer our knowledge, that what we've learnt can be used elsewhere. What we've learnt about um, creating a circuit, an electrical circuit in design and technology, such as using our Makey Makeys, as you'll be doing as part of your um, tutorial activities, could also be useful in understanding what we're learning about how batteries work in science. So there can be a range of ways that we can use what we've learnt elsewhere. What we've learnt about solving problems and maybe um, interviewing and surveying uh, students to make a list of their preferred uh, lunches um, as part of a digital technologies task could also be useful in mathematics when we're learning about statistics and making lists and counting and working out averages. So being able to transfer knowledge from one domain, as we call it, to another domain is again a useful critical and creative thinking skill. So these all form the critical and creative thinking skills that students will develop. Now they can be really useful when students go to apply these in various contexts and those contexts can apply outside of school. There are a range of competitions that students can be involved on. These are ones relating particularly to digital technologies and design and technologies that students can engage with these and um, challenge their own critical and creative thinking skills and other skills that we're going to be learning about against other students. Uh, these are the main ones involved in Australia. The BHP awards are particularly focused on um, design and technology activities. The Google Science Fair ones and the Young ICT Explorers, particularly on digital technologies. And the Imagine Cup is another one that focuses on various technologies. But they all involve relatively similar processes and critical and creative thinking skills and the other thinking skills that we're going to explore. Okay. So to build students' capacity to solve complex problems, those X problems, and develop X solutions, we need a range of techniques for students to be able to be creative, come up with original ideas, if only for themselves. So for young kids, coming up with an original idea um, that others have used before, it's still original for that child. Um, but the ideas have to have value. Coming up with an idea is fine but it has to be valuable. Um, students will often come up with crazy ideas, but they don't have any actual practical value. So they do still have to have some value. And there are a range of techniques that you can explore that can assist students with this. Um, word association, what we call linking, can be a great way of coming up with new ideas, combining different words. Um, uh, transport and food. How can we make our transport experiences and our food experience is better. Maybe we can have food that is cooked as we travel along in our cars by putting the food in the engine and the engine cooks the food. Uh, there could be a range of different ways of coming up with creative ideas to problems by linking various words together. What's called black boxing, where we just look at what comes into a problem and what comes out of a problem without worrying about the processes involved in solving it. Um, so there can be a range of inputs to a problem. Let's say it's a problem of um, jumping over a fence. Uh, so some of the inputs would be things such as uh, the danger involved. Injuries could be involved of climbing over the fence. Uh, the height of the fence could be an issue. Um, whether or not the fence is electrified. There can be a whole range of different inputs to the problem. Then there's outputs in terms of um, how high we can, we can um, go over different fences, how we can avoid touching the fences. There can be a whole lot of outputs to that problem. And by looking at that, we can then get a better understanding of the problem without having to worry so much about solving it. It allows us to creatively think about different possibilities by looking at the inputs and outputs. Then there's looking at parallels, which is looking at similar past solutions to problems. 
So if we're trying to make a better mousetrap, we'd look at existing mousetraps. We'd look at other ways of catching things. Um, maybe looking at fishing or big game hunting. Um, there could be a whole range of different ways of catching things that could be paralleled in looking at making a better mousetrap. Um, variation, looking at different aspects of something. Um, so taking, say, an automobile and looking at different ways of modifying it. We could make it lighter. We could make it um, more streamlined. We could change the color. That may not have a big impact on its performance, but it may have other impacts on other things. Um, change the door designs. Um, there could be a whole range of things that we can modify and vary around something that can change what we call its properties that can be a very creative process. And we can also look at adding things. Let's maybe add an additional engine to an automobile. Uh, we could add fins or wings or more wheels. So adding things in addition to combinations and variations allow us to creatively explore different possibilities. And there are a range of visualization tools that can also assist with um, critical and creative problem solving. Uh, brainstorming, you're probably aware of. There's also the thinking hats where everyone takes on a different perspective in looking at the problem and tries to look at that problem from a different particular perspective. There's brain writing, which is like brainstorming, but a bit more um, expansive. Uh, SWOT analysis, where we look at strengths, weaknesses, and interesting aspects. Um, thinking outside the box as a concept. And there's also a more formalized method called TRIZ, which is a way of developing creative thinking processes. And you can um, Google or Wikipedia those various ideas and come and see what they involve. OK, so we need to understand that creativity is a process. We can teach creativity. Um, some people think that creativity is an innate skill, but there are ways we can use to teach and develop creativity in our students. Um, this is just one approach, but it goes through five stages. Preparation. We need to be in the right mindset to be creative. Um, and schools are not particularly good at that. Uh, so we need to get students in that state where they're thinking creatively and freely without worrying about consequences and risks. There needs to be an incubation stage where students actually mull over and think about um, a problem. And again, we do this really badly in schools where we say, OK, everyone, we're going to be creative. You've got five minutes to come up with this creative solution. That's not really conducive to good creativity. Sometimes creativity can take days, weeks, months, years. Obviously, we can't allow that, uh, that time frame in, in schools, but the unconscious mind can bring a lot to the creative process. Allow students to go home and think and dream about their ideas. Um, to spend a week or so in preparation before the lesson or before the activity to be thinking about their ideas and what they might do during the actual um, creative activity. Then we have intimation. This is where we have students get a feeling of a solution being on its way. They don't quite have the idea yet, but they know that they've got the, ger the germ of an idea. Um, and it needs to germinate. It needs to um, develop further. And they're only part way through developing it. And that's an important stage. And many of us go through that. Um, but eventually we get to illumination or insight where we come up with this great new idea and it's wonderful and we think fantastic now we have to define it and write it down and express it and communicate it to others and then we have verification where we explain our idea we consider our idea is it going to solve the problem um, is it going to have really bad consequences we have to think about think through our idea and consciously consider it so that's an approach to creative and um, critical and creative problem solving. So an important aspect is not to expect students to be creative instantaneously. It does take some time. And in terms of creating an environment where students feel free to be creative, we have to make sure we're not inhibiting their creativity. And we do that a lot in schools. There is the fear of failure. Of course, we associate consequences with failure, um, a bad mark bad comments, negative comments, students laughing at them, teachers laughing at them. Um, these are things we need to avoid in trying to promote a creative environment. So students should feel free to be able to come up with the most insane ideas 
and explore them. And they need to be resilient enough to face criticism of their ideas, valid criticism. Yes, we want to minimize inappropriate criticism, but we also want to inc incorporate appropriate criticism where students point out problems with their ideas, where teachers point out problems with their ideas and students to understand that that is fine. That is part of learning, that they're now going to be able to take that and improve their idea. And sometimes it means they have to give up their idea and explore something else where their idea just isn't going to work. They need to be prepared to fail and fail a lot, fail often and fast. This is a, a really important aspect of being creative, not holding on to ideas that have failed, moving on and coming up with new ideas and seeing that as a positive. It's a really important part of the creative process. Okay, so there's this idea of, of um, trying to spot failure quickly, failing early and being able to recover from failure at any stage in a project. Um, and perfectionism can result in stagnation where students just try to get everything working perfectly. We need to understand that it's okay for bits not to work perfectly as long as we're still progressing and improving and that that iterative process will eventually result in a really good solution. But it may not be a really good solution at the start. There's going to be time needed for it to develop into that. Okay, so one thing in schools, we often set problems that have a guaranteed solution. Um, that the teacher knows the solution and the students are working essentially to find out what the solution is that the teacher wants to find out. And there's generally only one solution. Um, and these are very abstracted problems. They don't represent the real world in any respect. Students need to understand that real world problems have many different possible solutions. And we often don't ever achieve full success, that we, we achieve partial successes. And that's okay. Those partial successes can be good enough to solve the problem. Um, but understanding that is something that's difficult for students, and particularly when we often teach the opposite in schools. And we need to support students in engaging with the open-ended nature of particularly project-based learning, where they're never going to get the perfect solution. They'll eventually get a really good solution, but it will never be perfect because perfection is something that then means it could never be improved upon. And things can always be improved upon. Okay, so this now leads us into what we call strategic thinking. And this is a range of thinking approaches that we incorporate into technologies education. Now, last session, we looked at collaboration, moonshots and growth mindsets and project management. So this time we're going to look at entrepreneurship in particular. But these strategic thinking approaches help students with developing their strategies and their making judgments and decisions about what to do in a project. And particularly it helps teachers make judgments around looking at how students are engaging with their own thinking. Um, so it allows you to interact with your students in a way that promotes their intellectual development. That, ex that when students understand these strategic thinking processes, they feel part of the process of setting out how they do things, rather than just relying upon teachers to tell them what to do. It's that recognition that everyone can contribute to these strategic thinking processes, planning out how to do their projects, how much time to spend on different parts of their project, um, when it needs to be completed. One of the criteria for it to be successful, these are all things that students increasingly need to have a say in, because it develops really important real world processes that they're going to need to use throughout their lives. And if the teacher is just doing all of these decisions for them, they're not being given an opportunity to develop these. Now, of course, for young students, they need to be structured and scaffolded in developing these capacities. Um, how, to, how much time to spend on various phases of a project is something that young children don't have a good grasp of. 
it needs to be developed. But that is part of the process. And eventually it needs to be developed over a long stage process where students are making those decisions and managing their own time, their own criteria for success in, in making judgments around projects and all the rest. Okay, so entrepreneurship is one we're going to focus in on. This relates often to innovators and we see um, people taking sometimes great risks, but getting fantastic rewards and becoming outstanding successes in business and in other parts of the world. But it's not the only area of entrepreneurship. There are a range of types of entrepreneurship. Yes, there are business entrepreneurs and they develop successful startups and make billions of dollars. And, um, and that's something that certainly we can encourage students towards. But there are also creative entrepreneurs that create fantastic creative works, become our artistic um, star cases. There's also social entrepreneurs that work with others and community benefits and, and change the world in terms of society. We also have knowledge entrepreneurs that explore and create new knowledge and understanding of the world, scientists and things of that nature. And we have institutional entrepreneurs that work within businesses and, and they're great managers and processes, but they aren't necessarily um, making huge amounts of money. They might work in the government or in other places where creating money is not their focus, but they are still entrepreneurial. So what makes someone entrepreneurial is that they are trying to create a preferred future. They're trying to create the world better. Now, it may be better in that they make more money, but there are lots of other ways of making the world better other than just that. So there are a range of different ways we can think about being an entrepreneur. And this is called effectation or effectuation, sorry. Um, and there are five key principles related to this. First is bird in the hand principle. That entrepreneurs start with, they don't start with a goal or a problem to solve. They start with what they have. And we call this entrepreneurial capital. They have certain skills and capabilities. Um, they might have certain equipment or resources or networks family, friends, and they draw upon that to do things, which is very different to how we often frame problems and projects in schools, where we give them a goal or a problem. That's quite different to how entrepreneurs see the world. So they also have what's called an affordable loss principle. So they don't focus on what they're going to gain or achieve. Again, how we frame things very often in education. They frame things in what they're prepared to lose and how they can minimize that. So how much time are they prepared to devote to doing this particular um, project? Um, what could be the social costs in their team formation? Are they going to not invite their friends to be part of their team? Because they want some members of their team to be address their weaknesses. So they'll make selections based upon the benefits towards achieving um, what the team can achieve rather than on social networks. Um, or what could be the risk to their reput reputation in terms of failure or success through doing a project? Very different mindsets to how we train our students around focusing on what they'll gain or achieve in terms of marks. Now, one example of that is the Fiverr Challenge, um, where students are given $5 and designed to create a business for, with that how they can um, take that $5 and make money with it. And you'll see some students that will take a more traditional focus, um, might invest it in a bank and get their 2% interest and end up with $5 and two cents um, at the end of the project. But that's against the entrepreneurial thinking approach would be to take that $5 and maybe start um, buy $5 worth of lemon, lemons and sugar and start a lemonade stand and sell lemonade and start a little business to try to capitalize upon um, their skills and knowledge about making lemonade. Um, so there can be a whole range of different ways of going about um, spending that $5, but it depends upon whether people have an entrepreneurial mindset or a more traditional mindset. 
as to the approach they may take. The crazy cook principle involves cooperating with those that you can trust. Um, and it's not keeping your ideas secret. Now, very often students in a more traditional mindset will think, OK, I've got this great project idea. Now, I need to keep that secret so I maximize the, the grades and um, rewards the teacher gives for me doing that. Now, entrepreneur goes, no, let's tell everyone about this idea and try to bring others on board that have capacity to enhance that idea and so that we can make it a better um, solution by combining a whole lot of other ideas and a whole lot of other people's skills to make it a better outcome. So it's not trying to do it yourself. It's trying to get others to contribute to the idea to make it a much better idea. That my idea is not the best idea. That others can contribute and will make that idea much better. Then we have the lemonade principle, which is essentially if life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. Um, so this is looking for new opportunities. And this is where most of our major business people achieve success. The pandemic, everyone sees it as a bad thing. No, entrepreneurs see it as a great opportunity. There's an opportunity to invest in creating um, uh, anti anti oh, sorry, vaccines and ways of um, exploiting the pandemic. Some people see war as a really horrible, terrible thing. Entrepreneurs see it as a fantastic opportunity to change systems and make money and do a whole lot of other um, ways that most people wouldn't consider that as an opportunity in that environment. Now, of course, our students hopefully won't be thinking about viruses and war, but any situation that has a problem or difficulty can open up opportunities for entrepreneurial ways of addressing it. Then there's a pilot in the plane principle. This is where we can't always predict what's going to happen, but we're in the driver's seat. We can make decisions and influence things. We don't just accept things happening to us, which is how many people do accept the world. But an entrepreneur sees the world in such a way that they are there and they have, they have some power and influence to change things. And if things aren't going the way that they want, if the, if the future is not looking to be the way that they want it to be, they can make it happen that way. And that's the part of the plan principle. OK, so entrepreneurs do not find a problem and search for means to solve it. They use effectuation principles to use the capital that they have to look at possible problems to solve or exploit. And negatives are seen as opportunities. Um, they measure themselves not by what they've achieved in the past, but what they may achieve in the future. And they're always looking to develop their capital in terms of new knowledge and skills, but it doesn't need to be their knowledge and skills. If they can develop friendships or access to other people that have those knowledge and skills, that's valuable in itself. Um, they try to address their weaknesses by bringing in others that have strengths that help them in solving problems. Now, some people can see that as exploitive, but from an entrepreneurial perspective, it's about bringing together people that help achieve their vision of the future. Okay, and through all of this, they expand their worldview. They look at all of the different things happening in the world and look for opportunities that are present in that world. Um, every new year, there are new opportunities coming out and they're trying to find ways of exploiting that. So in projects, you should try to give them opportunities to come up with their own problems to solve, not your problems. And they'll use their own existing capital and frame what resources and time frame and all the rest that they want to spend on that problem. They'll develop those um, rather than having teachers set that for them. So a very different mindset to how we do projects traditionally within schools. Okay, so um, when we have intrinsic project-based learning, where students can set things themselves, they're often set out to increase their capital through new knowledge that they have to learn in order to achieve what they want, um, learning about new concepts, building the resources that the student can draw upon, 
and expanding their entrepreneurial capital. Um, okay, so that's entrepreneurship. Now let's look at this idea I've been sort of presenting to you about creating preferred futures. Now this can be expanded into what we call futures thinking, where there are a range of techniques that we can teach students that will help them create their preferred futures. Um, so it's seeing the world as it may be and believing that they are empowered to make changes to it. Now, it may only be small changes, but they are still able to contribute towards making the changes and making the world that they want it to be. They need to understand that there is more than one possible future and they can help make decisions as to which future comes about. The idea that probability gives us a chance of something happening, that predictions are informed guesses from a range of possible outcomes. We're going to look at these ideas. Um, students through studying mathematics and through various other techniques in the curriculum learn about probability, about the fact that things can go different ways depending upon various factors. But we can make predictions, sometimes informed by probability, but our predictions are just guesses. But if we gather enough data that supports those predictions, they can be informed guesses. And they can let us understand that there are these different possible outcomes. And yes, we could, if we have enough data, we can assign probabilities to those different outcomes. But we don't have to go to that um, level of detail. Just understanding what these different possibilities are helps us then make decisions about how we might guide the future towards the one that we'd like to see happen. Okay, so that leads us into this idea of data and trends. So we want to collect data that helps us see what has occurred in the past. And if we collect that data and see what's occurred in the past, we can then extrapolate that data into the future to, to understand what might happen in the future. And this is creating forecasts, taking trends and considering what the world might be like if the best, worst, and most likely outcomes in these trends actually takes place. So um, in the tutorials, you're going to learn about creating a futures wheel. This is where we set out the possible trend outcomes. So we start with our problem, and then we build out making informed predictions about the different possible outcomes that may eventuate. Now, Part of this is that there can be different approaches to describing the future. So depending upon their difficulty, and we have one category of th well, three different categories of challenges. There are solvable challenges. Now, these are ones that we know how to solve. Um, and often we use forecasting to highlight these. We just need to make decisions about um, investing the effort into solving them. Then we have difficult problems. Now, these are ones that we know how to solve, but we generally, because of their difficulty, haven't solved them. Solvable challenges are ones that we, we're on our way to solve them. We know how to solve them. Things are in progress. We'll eventually solve them. Difficult ones, we know that they exist. We know generally how to solve them, but they're hard. Um, climate change is a good example. Yes, we know global warming is causing climate change and we could reduce climate uh, we could reduce global warming but reducing our carbon emissions um, we could reduce the amount of electricity we use reduce the amount of planes we fly the cars we drive so we know what to do it's just difficult to give up those things to accept the lower standard of living in order to affect that change but then we have another set of problems called wicked problems now, these are problems we don't know how to solve, and we don't even really know how to go about solving them. But there are some techniques we can still use to address these, um, and one is called backcasting. We're going to have a look at that. But collectively, these three approaches give us a set of tools that allow us to better understand what may be occurring and how we can tackle the problems, how they've been solved in the past, and how we can develop eventual solutions to really complex, difficult problems. 
almost any problem can be solved. Um, it just needs the application of sufficient effort and a, um, thinking different, differently in order to solve it. And students need to understand that. Okay, so future thinking involves students deliberately considering the future as they would prefer it to be. Understanding that there are a range of different possible futures and that they can work towards achieving their preferred future, often through developing X problems that require X solutions, but we can achieve preferred futures. Um, they need to be able to differentiate between the idea of predictions, being informed guesses, and probability, where there's a specific chance of something coming about or not coming about. And the difference between what we call science fiction and science faction or, or reality or science fact, things that are known and things that are imagined. Science fiction has led us to a lot of um, things that have eventually eventuated. Um, iPads were envisaged in Star Trek 40 years before they were actually um, developed. Science fiction can give us great ideas, but until those ideas are actually created, they represent fiction. But eventually they are turned into things and they become reality or, sci or science fiction. Okay, so one of the approaches we first start to when we come to problem solving is we have to get an idea of what's involved. And this is called an environmental scan. Essentially, it's just researching the problem. Um, thinking about all the aspects of the problem and trying to gather data about that problem. Um, and information sources for that data, finding out what is known about the problem. And this might be from newspapers or books or from the internet, asking friends and other students, uh, teachers, family, local community, or experts in the problem, but understanding the problem in more detail. Now, from that understanding, they should then develop a realization of the importance of data in making decisions. Yes, we might have some understanding, but trying to convince someone of, of something about that, unless we have data, is very difficult. Of course, it just becomes opinion. But if we have some sort of data, some sort of measurements or some sort of uh, material that we can point to and say, this gives an indication of this happening, then we can make a much stronger argument for things. We also need to look for where the gaps are in data, where in terms of a problem, we just don't have any solid understanding or data about that problem. Of course, that can be really important. Why don't we have that understanding? Has it been suppressed? Have we just never bothered to collect it? Has it been considered not important? But in understanding a problem, if we can see a real big gap in that data, then going out and collecting some information about that, collecting some data, might provide really great insightful new ways of understanding and solving that problem. Okay, so we develop our environmental scan and we develop a more complete understanding of the problem. Now through that, we should also understand the importance of sharing data. As students try to gather data about their problem, um, they'll come up with roadblocks where they can't get the data. It's either not accessible, it's got to pay money for the data, or it's hidden away behind government uh, firewalls and so forth. There can be access to data and there can be limitations on access to data. And when we need data in order to help solve our problems, we understand the importance of data in that respect. But we also need to understand that sometimes there are legitimate reasons not to share that data. Sometimes there are, it's inappropriate to share that data. There could be consequences of people using that data inappropriately. And that we have a right to privacy of data. We don't have an automatic right to seek and receive data, particularly from individuals. Um, so this brings us into the whole area of data security and data and information and so forth that we'll be exploring in digital solutions, uh, digital technologies. Okay, so as part of futures thinking, one of the first skills that students need to develop is an understanding of trends. This is where we collect data on what's happened in the past um, and organize it in such a way that we can um, see it, see how what's happening. Are things increasing? Are they decreasing? Are they staying the same? Are they going up and down, what we call oscillating? This turns data into information. 
where we can actually make inferences from the data and explain the world as it relates to that data in different ways. And we can use various tools to help us structure that data. The main one we often use is graphs, but we can also use tables and infographics and um, wordles and images. There are various ways of representing data. Let's say we're collecting data on the weather. Um, each, each day the students make an observation of, of the sky and on, the, on a poster we put a, a sun if it's sunny, a cloud if it's cloudy, um, a raining cloud if it's rainy, and things of that nature. And we start then collecting data on the weather. And then we can apply some numerics to that. We can count the number of sunny days there have been, the number of rainy days, the number of cloudy days. And we can look at that data now and we can turn it into some graphs in terms of um, sunny and um, cloudy and rainy. And then once we have that, and we can see that, okay, over a month, three quarters of the day were sunny. Um, one eighth of the day was rainy and another eighth of the day was um, cloudy. So from that, we can now, we've now got some data. We can actually do some probabilities. 75% of the time, it's sunny. 12.5% of the time, it's rainy. 12.5% of the time, it's cloudy. We've now got data which we can make predictions. So this is where we can take data and develop what we call trends. Now, one of the really useful things of this is we can then um, use data in different ways. Now, in FTA 2, students should be creating data on paper and making simple um, tables and, and so forth. In years three to six, they should start using spreadsheets and um, analyzing data in different ways, sorting it and structuring and making graphs and things of that nature. Then in years seven and eight, they develop information systems, more complex sort of spreadsheets. And then in years nine and 10, they create online database systems that link to live data sources. So collecting data from the Bureau of Meteorology and things of that nature. So this is all around developing this idea of trend data. Now we can get this data from lots of different places. They can collect it from their friends and their family. Um, and over time, students should expand their scale and scope and time frame of how they collect data. They might collect it initially, um, say, from just their classmates. Then they might do a, a project where they collect it off all the year sixes in the school. Um, eventually, they might do one where they collect it off the families of all the year sixes. This idea of expanding the scale and the scope of their data. And also the time frame. They might collect data over just once off or they might collect data um, once a week for a month. So this expands the, the range of data collection. Okay, so trends are where we can see things happening over time with the data that we've collected. Um, and generally we have things such as climate data or population changes, but it can also exist in other things such as fashion and design trends. Uh, music trends change over time. And we can also collect data around the sharing of ideas. There are trends in how ideas promulgate. And we see that in the idea of memes and online videos and things of that nature, which become popular. And But essentially, we want to collect trends that we can extrapolate into the future by continuing the trend on a graph. So if things have been staying the same, we can continue that trend and make a prediction that or a forecast that things are likely to remain the same. Um, if they've been going up, we can make a prediction that they're likely to continue to go up at that same rate or go down at the same rate. Or if they're oscillating, such as we have in seasons, uh, where things go um, high temperature in summer and low temperature in winter and then high temperature in summer, um, we can make a prediction that after it's been low temperature, it'll go back to high temperature again. Um, that's a seasonal prediction, but it's also a cyclical one. Uh, populations often go cyclical. If we have lots of rabbits, um, then eventually there'll be more wolves, but then as the wolf population increases, they'll eat more rabbits, and then eventually the rabbit population will go down. But the rabbit population will go down to a certain point where the wolves start starving and will get fewer wolves which will allow the population of rabbits then to recover 
and we have what's called a cyclical um, trend. Okay, so from these trends, we now want to make forecasts. This is where we make predictions based upon our trends. Um, looking at our preferred futures, we want to think about what are the different things that might occur if these trends continue, particularly when we have multiple trends and we look at how they may interrelate to one another. And forecasting can often be multi-stage, where we look at what how things might change in one year's time. Then if that happens, what might happen in two years' time, or five years' time, or a hundred years' time? So this is a game where we use futures wheels. So we start in the middle with our um, thing that we want to look at, the change that we want to consider. Let's say if it's a change from um, traditional to progressive education. Then around that, we'll put a whole lot of different issues related to education. It might be uh, parental expectations, um, entrance into universities, uh, difficulty of the content in the curriculum, time available in the curriculum. There could be a whole lot of things that we'd put around as what we call first order effects. Then as those things happen, they'll then affect other things. So if we say have one of our things would be class sizes, if the class size increases, what might that then cause? Maybe it'll have an effect on increased teacher burnout um, or reduced student performance. So they would be second order effects. So that would be in another concentric circle of effects of the first order effects. So we're looking at how things affect one another as they expand out in what we call a connection circle. So here we can see in a bit more detail, at the start we have our change, our first order effects from that change, then our second order, then our third order. So as the future world wheel is developed, we should be able to then see from those third or fourth order effects, which of these pathways through these various changes to these outer edge um, sort of outcomes, we would like to see happen and we'd identify our preferred future outcomes. But the main point of doing the futures wheel is to understand that there are a whole range of different possible consequences and outcomes from the decisions being made related to that change. And that some of these will end up as solvable um, solutions and some won't. But we get a better understanding of the problem and of the possible solutions to that problem by considering um, these future possibilities. Okay, so forecasts should strive to be plausible, relevant to the problem or the change being considered, be divergent, and that they look at different things in different ways, and be challenging. Challenge the fundamental beliefs. Be creative. Try to think outside the box and look at what might happen that other people haven't thought about in terms of what might happen. Okay. Now, sometimes we can envisage what we want to see happen, but we're not really sure how to get there. And then we use a technique called backcasting. So if we've identified our preferred future, let's say it's a world in which we um, have lots of trees and the CO2 levels in the atmosphere are stable and the temperature is nice and comfortable all year round and doesn't change particularly uh, doesn't have wild variations. So that's our future we want to get to. How are we going to get there? So this is something what we often call as a wicked problem. We can sort of envisage the problem, but we're not sure how to actually make it make a solution to that problem. So one approach is backcasting. This is where we try to deconstruct back from the future to the present what would be the steps needed to get there? Now, in normal forecasting, we go, as in our futures wheel, we build out concentric circles. Um, we look at what's happening now, and look at what might happen, then what might happen after that, then what might happen after that. In backcasting, we look at the future we want. We look at, okay, what would be needed first off to get there? Then, okay, well, if that can be achieved, what would then be needed to achieve that? If that can be achieved, what would be needed to then achieve that? And ideally, eventually, we then get back to the present 
and can see a pathway to achieving that wicked problem. Um, this is a technique called decomposition, and it's one of the techniques we'll be looking at in computational thinking next week. So in a diagram, step A is awareness of the problem and having that vision of the future. Step B is an understanding, okay, where we are now at the, at the present, called our baseline. Step C is coming up with creative solutions, starting with the visioning, starting with the future, and stepping back on how we can achieve various steps towards achieving that. And then D is prioritizing which of those are most important towards getting to that vision of the future. Okay, so when students can are unable to identify a process from going, getting to their preferred future, breaking it down into simpler and simpler steps called decomposition can be a way of helping them achieve solvable um, chunks. So they can't achieve the whole problem, but they can achieve smaller bits of it. And by achieving enough of those smaller bits, they can then recombine them and achieve the whole solution. Um, and again, we can often use various um, graphical representations to better understand things by doing diagrams and infographics and models and graphs and so forth, particularly in seeing the relationship between data, which become a big thing in the new in the curriculum. Okay, the last technique in futures thinking is building scenarios. Now, scenarios are essentially stories about different possible futures to help us understand what these preferred futures would be. They're essentially what might occur. They're narratives, but they're based still on the trends and predictions and forecasts that we've been able to um, un develop. So they're not just complete works of fiction. They are, they are plausible based upon the data that we have. And essentially we build a best case scenario, a worst case scenario, and then the most likely scenario which is usually somewhere between the best and worst cases. This again helps students understand that there are a range of different possible solutions and preferred futures, um, and that we can come up with ways of getting there, but we may not necessarily get to a perfect preferred future. There may need to be some compromises, but we can still work towards it and that will still be a benefit in itself, even if we don't necessarily achieve the perfect solution. What we want to avoid is that worst case scenario as much as possible. And this very much has to do with our understanding of sustainability, which is a major theme throughout the curriculum. Okay, now sustainability though, could not just relate to um, environmental issues, can also relate to economic issues. How can it be sustainable in terms of the economy? So we don't all, um, become destitute or lose too many jobs as a result of the changes that we envisage and so forth. And also social sustainability, so that society remains functioning and stable. Yes, we could all say we can go live in the forests and make our own food and that's probably be great for the environment, um, but societally it might be rather problematic. All of this is around expanding students' perspectives and understanding different possible futures and different possible worlds, but also understanding that different students and different people have different preferred futures. Not everyone wants to see the world as we envisage. And sometimes we need to make arguments for our preferred futures. And we need to use predictions and trends to support those arguments. Climate change debate has been a good example of that. Many didn't want to see changes because it impacted upon their way of lives, having to reduce the size of their cars or reduce their number of flights overseas. Um, these are reasonably significant impacts, but unless there was data and to support the predictions being made, it was difficult to convince people of those of the importance of making changes. Okay, so ideally then we come up with these wonderful scenarios that uh, depict the future and students can then work towards creating um, their preferred future. Now remember for young children, their preferred future may be being able to stay up late and watch TV more often. 
um, and working out various strategies and and so forth related to that. Doing a trend analysis of their grades in school and relating that to the amount of homework that they're doing and how they're getting their homework done um, quicker so that they can justify spending more time uh, watching TV and showing that there's no negative consequences in that their school grades aren't dropping by showing that, that data. So these big picture um, issues can often be made um, contextualized for very young children. Okay, so that's been looking at futures thinking. Now our next thinking skill is systems thinking. This again has four components. Um, but essentially systems thinking is looking at the world as it is now and where it's going to go in the short term. Futures thinking is looking where it's going to go in the long term. Systems thinking is better understanding it now and how as things change in the immediate, they're going to have certain effects. But it also helps us expand our worldview and incorporate larger and larger interactions about the world. Now, essentially, event oriented thinking is where we think in straight lines. We have cause and effect. These things happen, they make this thing happen. I get really bad grades, I get in trouble at home. Simple cause and effect relationships. Systems thinking sees the world in terms of interactive looping structures, where we have lots and lots of different um, systems interlink with one another. So, um, getting bad grades at school doesn't necessarily mean they're going to get in trouble at home. It may, but it may also relate to how the parent got bad grades in school and it affected their employment opportunities, which affected their view of schooling and the importance of school. So understanding that system of the parent gives us a better understanding of why getting bad grades in school might impact getting, a, getting in trouble at home. Looking at the other system of why we got bad grades in school. Was it because we were spending too much time on sport and we were doing really well in sport, but it impact, had an impact upon our grades. Um, and so that might be a way of explaining why we had bad grades. Or it might be that um, turmoil at home in terms of parental conflict was creating an environment where we couldn't focus and were being distracted. And so that then may then interrelate with the system of the parents at home. So all of these interactions become much more complex and able to be analyzed in different ways when we start thinking about things in terms of systems rather than simple causal effects. Okay, so how do we do this? Essentially, we, we build models of the various systems that exist for a problem. Now, we need to understand that the, the models will always be inaccurate. Any model of the real world, unless it models every atom or every quark in the, in the world, is going to be inaccurate. Um, they're always going to be approximations. But they allow us to think about the world and think about the interactions and the systems in different ways that can help us much better understand the problems that we're trying to solve. Okay, so teaching students about system thinking involves um, visualization, so understanding what's happening and building a, a model of that interactions that helps us engage with the complexity, uncertainty and risks involved in the problems. So children will often think of, of things, of the properties of systems as belonging to the individual parts of a system. Um, let's say a, say a bicycle. So if we think of a bicycle, and we can think of various parts. Um, it's got some gears, it's got some a steering wheel, it's got a seat, it's got um, wheels. We never, th or many people don't think of those as systems. But a seat is a comfort system. It has certain amount of padding, certain amount of um, springiness, certain width. There's a whole range of different factors that are involved in the system of a seat on a bicycle. Likewise, the gears are a complex system of different ratios and chains and transfer of force around that. Um, 
the wheel is a is a complex system in terms of how many spokes and has in terms of the amount of flex the wheel has the width of the tires determines the type of purpose the bike is going to be used for um, whether or not it's racing or bmx or um, motocross or a whole range of different things um, then there'll be a braking system there'll be a warning system in terms of a bell and lights and um, reflectors so there's a whole range of systems involved in a bicycle and having students understand that helps them better understand the overall system of course often one element of a subsystem that's not working well can have a big impact upon a larger system or sometimes an impact upon another subsystem where if we don't understand how those two subsystems fit within a wider system we can't see the relationships between those okay so let's watch a little video clip that looks at different uses of bicycles Okay, so we can see here that um, the bicycle video looked at a range of different purposes that can be applied to a bicycle. Um, it can be used as part of a transport system, uh, ambulance, medical system, um, water supply system. So thinking about the world in terms of systems allow us to take things and apply them in different ways that we wouldn't necessarily consider if we just saw bicycles as a bicycle system for say entertainment. Um, this broadens our worldview, our way of seeing the world and seeing and addressing problems. When you start seeing the whole world as a series of interconnected systems and every element of the world as a range of different interconnecting systems, it allows us to address issues in the world in different ways. Um, and we're going to look in particular about some processes called stock and flow and causal relationships. There's a whole range of others, but we're going to focus on just a few basic skills in systems thinking as part of this course. Okay, so students should recognize that no system model will be entirely accurate, but they still provide us with insight. Now, the first skill that students need to understand as part of system thinking is that things change over time. Um, systems change by their nature. A system is never just static. Uh, there will always be some aspect of systems changing and students will have their own personal experiences of th things changing. And as we saw as part of futures thinking, collecting data on that change allows us to then represent that data in graphs and infographics and databases and things of that nature. So things change over time. Um, how these have changed over time can be different. Um, the period that they change over time, whether or not it happens quickly or over a long period of time. And it can either be constant, increasing, decreasing, or fluctuating, just as we looked at in futures thinking. So we can graph these and then develop trends and extrapolate those changes into the future. But the really significant part of system thinking is looking at the relationships between these various graphs and trends and how we develop what are called causal relationships or interdependencies where they affect one another. Um, so as I said, they're either they're changing dynamically, 
and they can change other systems. So systems affect other systems. And through all of this, we can make simulations of real world activities. We could simulate a school, we could simulate a classroom, we could simulate friendships. Um, so there can be a whole range of different ways we can simulate. In um, more commonly, we simulate things such as financial transactions with the stock market, make weather predictions. Science uses prediction, um, simulations a lot. We also a lot of simulations in computer games and many educational applications. So students can use digital technologies to create their own models of the real world through these simulation techniques. And you're going to do that as part of your tutorial activities. So one of the simplest ways of, of creating these simulations and doing um, systems thinking is creating what are called connection circles. So connection circles form part of what we call um, feedback loops, uh, where we can either have two sorts of feedback loops, either balancing or reinforcing. So in this example here, we have chickens laying eggs and they hatch to produce more chickens. Now this is called a reinforcing loop. Of course, we have a certain number of chickens laying, which produce a certain number of eggs. But the more eggs there are, the more hatchings there'll be, which will produce more chickens, which in turn produces more laying, which produces more eggs. Now, this is called a reinforcing loop, where we can assign um, positive or negative to that, and the values can increase. So the number of chickens laying will increase. So the number of eggs will increase, so the number of hatchings will increase, so the number of chickens will increase, which means the number of eggs being laid increases, and we have a reinforcing loop. But it also shows another loop, this is chickens crossing the road. So the more chickens there are, the more chickens will cross the road, and the more chickens will then expire by being hit by cars. Um, and the more chickens that expire by being hit by cars, the fewer chickens there'll be. So there we put a negative sign. So because there are some aspects making it increase and some aspects making it decrease, this is called a balancing loop where it will tend towards equilibrium, whereas a reinforcing loop will continue towards either increasing exponentially or decreasing exponentially. Now, one way of determining that is if you count up the number of pluses and minuses in a loop. Um, and if there's an odd number of minuses, it will be a balancing loop. Otherwise, it will be a reinforcing loop. So here we see for the chickens crossing the road, we have um, two pluses and a minus, which gives a um, an odd number of minuses, which means it's a balancing loop. Um, it will tend towards equilibrium. There will end up being um, we won't have a runaway excess of chickens. Of course, the more chickens there are, the more will be killed, which will balance that excess increase. Whereas for the number of eggs being laid, that's a reinforcing loop, which will continue to increase exponentially. They'll just increasingly become more and more chickens and more and more eggs um, until we are overrun with chickens and eggs. Now, these can become quite complex. This is one for a learning system. Uh, where we have aspects such as um, students reading the course readings, doing the watching the videos and doing the course readings, the amount of sleep students are getting, um, their group work and project work, and various interactions between all of these aspects, can, which either can be increasing or decreasing. And by building this model, we can better understand how students are engaging with a course of study and explore various elements of that. So this is an idea of a causal feedback loop. Now to make these, starting off and just making them as they were just demonstrated, can be quite daunting. So we use a technique called connection circles, which makes it much quicker and easier. So to do this, we draw a circle. And around the circumference of the circle, we put the elements involved in the system. So when I was just looking at one for students, we were looking at things such as the amount of sleep they had, um, the amount of course materials they had to work through, uh, the amount of time they had, the amount of projects and assessment items they have, all of these things would go around the outside. The amount of friends and social activities they've got to attend. These things 
And then we draw lines between them, how those things affect one another. If they increase, how will the other thing that they're affecting decrease or increase? If it increases, you put a plus sign on it. If it decreases, you put a minus sign on it. So the more assignments in the course, the fewer or the less time students will have to spend interacting with their friends. So it would be a, a minus sign interaction. Um, the increase in uh, assignments results in a decrease in student social activity. So by doing that, we can then identify what are called causal loops, where we can see the interactions between them. So we're going to look at another little video that shows this aspect. The connection circle shows the parts of a system and how those parts affect one another. It creates a visual representation of how a system works. Key parts of the system that can change over time are written around a circle. These parts are then connected with arrows to show cause and effect relationships. One reason this tool is so helpful in building understanding is that it creates a focus on the relationships among parts, not just on the parts alone. The simplest way to see the power of a connection circle is to show an example of how easy it is to create one. Here's one simple story with parts that affect one another. The first step is to read the story. In the late 1950s, the World Health Organization tried to eradicate malaria-causing mosquitoes in Borneo by spraying the village areas with DDT. Soon, the palm-thatched roofs of the village houses began to collapse. The predatory fly that ate palm-eating moth larvae, which fed on the palm fronds, had been annihilated by the DDT. The dead DDT contaminated flies were eaten by lizards that were then eaten by house cats, which also died. Soon, the disease-carrying rats began to invade the dwellings. To solve the problem, the World Health Organization dropped cats into the villages by parachute. After reading, highlight key parts that can change over time. Write up to 10 of these around the outside of a circle. You may need to choose which parts you think are most important if you highlight more than 10. Draw arrows showing cause and effect relationships. For example, as the number of mosquitoes goes up, the incidence of malaria goes up. As malaria rises, DDT is sprayed. As DDT in the environment goes up, mosquitoes, flies, lizards, and cats all go down because they're dying. Keep adding arrows showing other cause and effect links until you are satisfied that all important relationships are represented. After creating connection circles for a particular system, use them as a basis for conversation. For example, look for loops in the diagram, such as the one shown here. Mosquitoes go up, which increases malaria, which increases the DDT. The DDT decreases the mosquitoes, which decreases malaria. Of course, there are also unintended consequences, which then lead to even more disease. Another use is to compare how different people choose the elements and draw connections. Any given connection circle illustrates the beliefs or mental models of the person who draws it. Comparing circles creates an opportunity to broaden understanding. This is just one example. Create a connection circle for almost anything that has multiple parts affecting one another. For example, impacts of atmospheric CO2 on the ocean, interactions in a novel, or the effects of drought on the economy or the environment. Thank you for watching this short introduction to Connection Circles, brought to you by the Creative Learning Exchange. Okay, so it's a little video clip um, that shows the idea of Connection Circles. Where are we? 
So this is another example um, relates to um, fast food restaurants. So here, if we were looking at all the issues to do with um, fast food restaurants, um, we could look at the number of French fries being sold, the number of French fries being eaten, the fat being consumed, the number of restaurants available, the profits being made, alternatives to cooking uh, French fries, and concerns about health. So if these were the ideas that we put around our circle, and then we drew some lines indicating relationships between those, and expand them and continue drawing them until we start identifying some loops. So here now we can see a loop um, between the number of restaurants as that increases, the number of French fries increases, and the profits increase. And as profits increase, the more restaurants will be increasing. Of course, I'll open more restaurants. Then we can put our um, pluses and minuses on. In this case, we have three pluses. And then draw our causal loops. So our loop is actually on the left. We have our profits, number of restaurants, number of French fries being sold. And that's a reinforcing loop. Of course, the number of minuses isn't odd. But on the other side of things, we've got the number of French fries being sold increases the number of French fries being eaten, which increases the number of fat, fat consumption, which increases the health concerns. But as the health concerns increase, we actually see a decrease in the number of French fries being sold. And this is actually a, then a balancing loop. Of course, the number of minuses are neg uh, uh, is odd. Um, and so it won't, we won't see an an exponential increase in the number of French fries being eaten. Of course, eventually, health concerns will have an ameliorating influence on that. Okay, so using these two techniques, stock and flow maps and connection circles, you should be able to quickly generate causal feedback loops and better understand the symptoms, the systems that are being explored, um, and how we can then improve various aspects of those systems. Of course, just as we saw in that previous example, where the number of French fries being sold was a critical aspect of those two loops, actually affecting then that element may be really important in trying to solve the problem. Or the other aspect might be the health concerns. If we can affect health concerns, that may have a disproportionate impact on um, affecting the benefits of the whole system then say if we tried to affect the number of french fries being eaten of course just either limiting the number of french fries or doing something like that may not have a big impact if we're not addressing the health concerns which may be a much more important factor so that's where we can use the connection circles to better understand the system what are the important elements of that system and what are the things in that system we could change because that then helps us inform what solutions we come up with in that system. So here's another example. This is around making friends. So the more friends we have, generally, as the number of friends we have, making friends becomes easier. We can make more friends. But as we lose friends, um, if or the number of friends we have can also result in increasing number of losing friends, um, which can also then impact upon our number of friends. So the more friends we have can do both. It can increase making it easier to make more friends, but it can also make it easier to, to lose friends. Now, making more friends is reinforcing. It increases the number of friends we have, but losing friends is balancing. It decreases the number of friends we have. So it's just one of the approaches that have been used um, in helping students better understand the concept of friendship and how we can approach that. So let's have a look at how these students have engaged with the friendship um, system. We thought about all of our ways to to break the reinforcing loop. But we tried this. This is crossed out. We didn't. We didn't really get to. Well, it didn't work. 
that saying I'm sorry kind of worked, but we haven't tried these out yet. But um, the next time we get in a fight, we're going to try to um, try it. What would the behavior over time graph look like for this reinforcing loop? First, it would look like three. It would be bad. It would be, it would be, and then, and then we get our feelings and we were and keep going like this. And then one of the, and then one of the leverages would make us go down. If I have hurt feelings, if I play with someone, um, if that person doesn't really want to play with me, I could go ask one other person. If the reinforcing loop said um, nice words, hurt nice feelings, we could get rid of this, get rid of this, get rid of these, and change them to something that's not bad. Change it to something that's good. That will keep the loop going. Um, the thing is, like, whenever you have a reinforcing loop that's actually bad, you need to either find another friend or, um, or rather just think of something that can break the reinforcing loop. And if, it, and if it was also a good reinforcing loop, it wouldn't, like, have all these problems. Okay, so you can see there how students have been using um, the concepts of systems thinking to address issues that are important to them um, in terms of solving problems, coming up with various solutions to those problems by better understanding the systems involved with their friendships. Okay, so this leads us into a slightly more complex application of systems thinking where we develop what are called stock and flow diagrams. Um, essentially stock are the elements in our um, system that we can measure, that can increase or decrease. So they're things that we can see, feel, count or measure. Um, they don't have to be physical, but they do have something that can change um, and it can be measured. So this can be things such as um, water in a bathtub. We can see it flowing in and flowing out. And the stock is the amount of water in the bathtub. But that can also relate to money in your bank account, um, air quality, animal populations, human populations, and so forth. So as long it can increase, decrease, oscillate up and down, just as we've seen with our other um, aspects in futures thinking. But it's how it happens. That's what we're interested in with our stock and flow diagrams. If the flow is greater coming in than it is going out, then the value will increase. So if we're making more friends than we're losing, the number of friends we have increases. If we are putting more CO2 into the atmosphere than is being taken out of the atmosphere, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere increases. So that's the fundamental concept of stop and flow. Um, can relate that again to the friends example. And in drawing these, we have four elements of a diagram. We have the connectors between the various elements, the converter, which changes it from one to another, the stock, which is the value that is increasing or decreasing, and the flow, which is the rate of of the change overall. So here's an example, a little bit more of the friendship um, model. So again, we've got making friends and losing friends. But making friends can, we can look at kids without friends and include those as part of our friendships. Um, and that draws from the total number of kids available. Um, but there's the number of friends we have and the number of total kids available relate to the possible number of few friends we could make each week. There's a finite number of new friendships that would be possible. Um, so these are ways of increasing our understanding of the system by exploring these various stocks and flows. So essentially they become stories where students explore various elements of the system that they're exploring and how things are changing over time. And remembering some of these 
interactions are going to be balancing where they stay within a certain range and some will be where they increase or decrease exponentially and they often call be the problem ones of course any exponential change often results in some problems now these can be used in various real world problems um, world population how it's increasing avalanches are a good example of an exponential change going out of control um, epidemics again use a lot of this um, system modeling to model how epidemics um, affect populations rumors are another example fads interest rates confidence levels soil fertility um, exercise levels um, supply and demand fire management even the cruise control in our vehicles how it it relates to inputs and keeps our vehicles moving um, along a center line relate to these models okay so let's now look at an example of how it's being used in a storytelling example of a story called the waterhole um, which is a children's book story about animals turning up to a waterhole um, and as more animals came to the waterhole they drank more and more water in the waterhole and the water levels decreased um, and it was also used as part of a science experiment looking at um, the flow of water and ecological systems. Using the system thinking tools with the book The Waterhole by Graham Mace. We were talking about how the waterhole got smaller and smaller. The bottle represented the waterhole. We were letting go of the water go, which represented the animals drinking. The water in the bottle was getting lower from the animals drinking it. The behavior over time graph was showing how the water was getting lower and lower. We were letting the water go, which represented the animals drinking. The animals drank all of the water, so they all left. It rained and rained and rained, so the animals came back because there was water. The water going into the funnel represented the rain. This it was a behavior over time graph showing the number of animals drinking at the water. We were talking about more and more animals drinking at the water hole and there was less water in the hole. We started drawing our stock flow diagram. Tracy was showing us how to draw a stock flow diagram for the water hole. We're discussing how the water decreased over time, showing how the water went in and went out. This is when we started the stock flow diagram showing the number of animals at the water. We were talking about the water going in by it, the rain and the water going out because of the animals drinking it. We were talking about the number of animals walking to the water hole and walking away from the water hole. This stock flow diagram shows that when the water is up, the animals walk to the hole and when the water is low, the animals walk away. Using the okay, so that's an example where um, quite young students are exploring a story and the problems happening within the story and better understanding those problems through the use of systems thinking. The last aspect of systems thinking is around simulations. Once we have a system that we can define in terms of stock flow diagrams, it's relatively easy to um, build a model of the world and then change various aspects of that system um, and see what happens. And we can then visualize 
this in what's called a dynamic simulation. We could change the amount of water coming into a system and seeing what effects that has on the overall system. We could change the number of animals drinking from the waterhole. What effect will that have? Um, and by building out this model of our system, we can then conduct experiments on it. We can explore what happens if different things happen, how that then affects the future, and ideally our preferred future. So there are a number of computer games and um, digital si systems that students can use for this exploration. There are ones that simulate roller coasters. Um, SimCity and the whole Sim series of computer games are very good for this. Um, SimCity allows students to actually manage all the complexities of a city. The transport networks, the um, town planning networks, the water networks, electricity networks, um, disaster management networks, education networks. It's a really, really complex simulation of, of dozens and dozens of systems, of, of interrelated systems. But the system model itself is not that complex. Um, but it allows students to really explore a complex system, such as a city, and make changes to that in very dynamic ways and seeing what then happens as a result of those changes. Now, of course, many of our, we're not really going to use particularly in primary school um, systems modeling where students create a full complex system um, of problems that, as they relate to. We use it as a tool to help them better understand the systems that are part of their problems that they're exploring, to allow them to think about the different elements and how they interrelate with one another um, rather than just direct causal relationships. That's our main purpose of systems thinking. So the next aspect that we're going to explore is design thinking. So this is one of our core, or so are systems. Systems design and computational are the three core thinking skills of technologies education. And design thinking is around looking for needs and opportunities and creating solutions as they relate to criteria for success. Um, so there needs to be some criteria as to where we measure whether or not a solution is successful or not. And ideally, students should be involved in making those criteria and will be at various stages of their development. But it's around coming up with a design, implementing it, and then measuring its effectiveness. OK, so it underpins the whole particularly design and technologies subject, but it's also used very much in digital technologies. It's about identifying an, a need or an opportunity, generating a plan and realizing that plan as a solution and evaluating the result but also considering the impact of that may have on the wider society. And there we would use futures thinking and systems thinking to look at what possible impacts um, student solutions might have. So when developing their solutions, they consider the data that's available about their problem. Again, linking back to futures and systems thinking, the inputs and human interactions involved with using that um, solution that they come up with, how the users of that solution will interact with the solution, um, and the processes involved in that interaction. So for example, um, designing a maze and writing precise instructions for a robot to move through a maze. That, In that case, the user would be the, the robot, and it has to do various things within the constraints of the system that it's involved with and students need to program it to do various um, instructions. And if they make mistakes, there's going to be consequences of those mistakes. OK, so let's look at some contextualization examples or a contextualized example of design thinking as it relates to one particular STEM project, um, creating roller coasters. Project where our first graders designed and created roller coasters by using the design thinking process. In the empathize stage, they gained an understanding of basic physics concepts such as potential energy, kinetic energy, and friction. They also played an online roller coaster game to see these concepts in action. 
After developing a problem sentence as a class in the define stage, students brainstorm multiple ideas for their roller coasters in the ideate stage. They teamed up with a partner to create a final blueprint. Once the blueprint was okayed by the teachers, students started to create and test their roller coasters using foam tubes, masking tape, and marble. Students troubleshooted failure points and developed their collaborative skills to work as a team. Okay, so you can see there is an example. Now they did use some terminology we haven't been using. Um, uh, the empath empathetic stage and the ideation stage. Those terms are, aren't used in the curriculum, but they we still do those same processes. We just use different terminology for them. So our first stage in um, design thinking is investigating and defining. And that can often include an empathetic stage. And uh, we did look at the challenge-based learning model, which had a strong emphasis on that empathetic phase, but it forms part of investigating and designing. And likewise, um, ideating is part of the generating and designing phase. But let's look at these different phases of design thinking. So first off, students need to uh, critically explore and investigate the needs, opportunities, and information available to them, exploring what they know about the problem. They need to critically reflect upon the intention, purpose, and operation of their solution and examine the values that they have around potential solutions. Is it going to potentially cause harm to someone or to the environment or um, various other aspects? Is it going to be exploitive? Uh, might make them lots of money, but will it cause people to go become poor and destitute? So these are all things that they can consider as part of investigating and defining. But essentially, they're looking at the implications of their solution and how it's going to um, affect the systems and the products and services and environments and needs of society. So they'll investigate this and make judgments and would often come up with what's called a design brief. Now, sometimes teachers will give students the design brief. Essentially, it's the assignment task sheet, um, which sets out what the design should achieve. Now, remember, though, back to entrepreneurial thinking, we can actually allow students to come up with their own design briefs as to what they would like to design and what the criteria for success would be for that um, solution. And allowing students to have opportunities to contribute to that can be a really important part of technology's education. Then we have the generating and designing phase. This is where students will develop and communicate ideas for a range of audiences. Um, and as they go up in age levels, it's for different audiences. But it's about communicating ideas and it's not just one idea. Students should always try to come up with a range of different possible solutions and then make judgments as to which, is, which of those they consider then the best one to take forward towards their solution. Coming up with a range of different possible paper plane designs and then making an informed decision maybe through testing and prototyping and exploring which ones fly the furthest, which one then maybe to make a hundred of to then sell as part of an entrepreneurial activity. Um, so it's often around thinking differently, trying to come up with new ways of doing things that will lead to their preferred futures and balancing various competing factors, um, the weight of the solution versus the cost of the solution versus the effectiveness of the solution. There'll be a whole range of different competing elements of their various proposed possible solutions that they need to then consider and make a decision then and justify that decision as to what they then take forward. And they'll often need to communicate that decision making process and they'll use graphical representation techniques to show their design and explain their design. Um, before it then goes to the next stage. Oops.
which is producing and implementing. So now students take the skills and techniques they have to make stuff and they either produce the products, services or environments that solve their problems. And they'll have various characteristics and properties related to um, the suitability of that solution to solving the problem. Of course, one of the key aspects you need to be monitoring as a teacher is the safe work practices that are involved. But students should also increasingly be self-monitoring that. Now, of course, you have the ultimate responsibility, but we want to teach students how to themselves identify when things are safe or not safe and make decisions about what to do. And also around accurate production, how to make sure that what they produce is um, accurate to what they designed it to be, rather than just something that ended up being created as part of their production process. So a big part will be around students making choices between the materials and the tools that they use. And you should try to give them a choice. Don't just always give them what you think is the best tool or um, materials to create their solutions. Allow them to learn, allow them to make mistakes, allow them to consider the different properties of the various tools and materials and make choices towards their solutions. They will make some mistakes. They'll then learn from those mistakes and may have a better understanding of what's involved with the properties and be more successful in learning than if you just guide them through the entire process. And of course, we want them ultimately to create successful design solutions, but it's much more about them learning in the process of that than in actually measuring the um, effectiveness of the final solutions. In terms of learning, that's really quite trivial. It is a focus of the whole process though, so we don't want to totally trivialize it, Students are interested in creating good, successful design solutions. We want to still reward and um, have that as a focus, but it's not the it's not the focus of the learning. OK, and then finally, we have evaluating. This is where students evaluate and make judgments. Now, to do that, they need to test. It can't just be reflection. What they need to have done is establish criteria for success. So even before they start their project, back in the very first stage, they need to identify what is going to be a successful solution to the problem. They then measure their eventual solution against what they decided was going to be the criteria for a successful solution. Now, again, obviously for young children, we start off with helping them with that process, giving them what the criteria will be. But over time, we want students to develop the capacity to identify and make their own criteria for success, what they feel will be a successful solution to the problem. And then their evaluation process is around seeing whether or not that has been achieved and making judgments on that and justifying that. Okay, so over time that, that will become more comprehensive and students will look at the implications and consequences of um, their solutions. Sometimes they'll take too long to complete. Sometimes they'll use too much of the resources. There'll be a whole range of different things that will impact upon their success criteria. And they need to then make tests and judge their design solutions against those criteria. Um, once they've done all of that, when the, once they've tested and made judgments, then they can reflect and consider how effective the process has been and look at where they can transfer their learning to other situations, as we looked at in critical and creative thinking. And then encompassing these four stages, we have one that incorporates them all, which is called collaborating and managing. Now in this, students learn to work collaboratively, and we looked at this um, last time as well, manage their time, manage their resources, and effectively create design solutions. And you can um, quantify those. You can say, okay, you've got $200 to do this um, task. Let's say it's building a bridge. Each paddle pop stick is going to cost you a dollar. Each dollop of glue will cost you 20 cents. Uh, and they have to work out how much to spend on the paddle pop sticks versus the glue or versus other things. 
Um, and budgeting that and making decisions about the resources they have can be an important part of a design challenge. They also need to work collaboratively and make collaborative decisions on those things. So different students will have different perspectives. Um, say if it's choosing how to spend the resources, they have to make some sort of agreement on that, um, an agreement on the design that they're going to actually eventually do, agreement on how much time to spend on different things, who is going to be responsible for different aspects of the task, um, how they're going to then communicate and share their ideas. That can be an important part, particularly in convincing the other team members about their ideas, recognizing that um, everyone's ideas have some value, but you need to make a collective judgment as to which one you're going to go ahead with. And then it's okay if some ideas are not followed through on. It doesn't necessarily reflect on the person, it just reflects upon the idea and that other ideas were better. Okay. Also, we often um, nominate roles, having someone be a leader or a timekeeper, a manager of resources, a documenter. These can be all part of the roles. Um, say in the bridge building activity again, some people, some of the students in the group might be in, involved with gluing things together. Others might be in collecting the resources and um, organizing them. Others might be in testing and making sure that they're, all the joins are strong. There can be a whole range of different activities and responsibilities as part of a team. And again, wherever possible, students should be involved in that and learning about how to make compromises and work effectively as both leaders and followers. Okay, so students should be working individually and in groups and have opportunities to do both. Shouldn't always be doing group work and shouldn't always be doing individual work. They need to be able to plan, organize and monitor their timelines and to effectively use resources. Um, and over time, those processes can, can become more complex, such as looking at quality control and risks and time and costs and factoring all of those in what's called project management. Okay. So that's the content for this week, looking at the various aspects of or the various core concepts related to technologies education. Now in tutorials, you're going to have an opportunity to explore some of these. So the first tutorial activity is related to systems thinking, looking at some of the approaches that we have just examined. And you're going to create your own systems model um, and simulate that in a program called Loopy. Okay, so your challenge is to develop a system model for teaching technologies. So what are the various aspects of teaching the technologies learning area? And put those around on a connection circle around the perimeter, remembering that all the different elements need to be able to be counted. They need to increase or decrease as they're impacted upon by other elements. Then you'll draw um, lines between those um, with arrows and pluses and minuses, indicating whether or not as the source value goes up, whether or not the targeted value goes down or increases. Then from that, once you've created your model, you're going to create your causal loops in a program called Loopy. Now there's a link on the course website. And in this, you'll be able to draw your circles and the lines going between them, and it will generate the, um, the causal loop. And you can then press play, and it will simulate how things change. Now, it's a very simple program. It's only really used as a demonstration. You won't actually see the values change. You'll just see the size of the, of the filled in circles change. But it'll give you a bit of an idea of what's happening with your simulation. Um, to help you in Loopy, there is a how-to section and some examples. So you can have a look at that and see how to actually create your Loopy, um, your causal loop, and share that onto Teams. Now in tutorial, you're going to look at the how we can use various devices to connect to computers and control computers in different ways. We can use keyboards and mice commonly, but we can also connect other things to computers. And in schools, we commonly use a device called the Makey Makey, which allows us to connect um, things that we create to a computer. 
and it will simulate or it will send to the computer keystrokes like letters A, B, C, or D, or mouse clicks. And on the computer, then we can have computer software such as a game or simulation we make in a program called Scratch um, that respond to those keystrokes. So if the letter A is um, pressed, something happens on the screen. Um, and then we can connect something to the computer so that we can have something happen that tells the computer this thing has happened. Um, it sees it as the letter A being pressed, makes the simulation or the computer program do something as if the letter A has been pressed. Now, there's a video clip of how the Makey Makey works on the course website for you to have a look at that shows the range of different interactions that we can have with different devices. What you're seeing on the screen is the banana piano, where we can touch different bananas and different notes will play on the computer through the Scratch program, um, through the interface of the Makey Makey. But there's lots of other creative ways of using the Makey Makey. And that's what makes it such a powerful tool in technologies education. So on campus students, you're going to use actual Makey Makeys and you're going to learn about digital systems and electrical engineering through creating um, a Makey Makey interface to a Scratch program and how it changes that program. Oh, so you're not going to use a Scratch program. You're going to actually make a, um, well, actually you're still going to use Scratch, but you're going to make an operations game. Now, the operation game is a game where you use tweezers to pick body parts out of a simulated um, human being. Um, and if you touch the sides with the metal tweezers, a uh, buzzer goes off or a light flashes, indicating that you've touched the side and the poor person has died as a result of the operation. Um, so you're going to make that out of cardboard. And using the Makey Makey, you're going to connect it up to the computer. And well, first off, you connect it to a light or a buzzer. But ideally, if you work quickly and have time, you'll connect it up to computer using the Scratch program and have it so that it counts the number of times you touch the sides of the body and have that aspect of interaction. So try and get that done. At least get the cardboard one working and, and made. But if you've also got time, have it also interface um, using the Makey Makey to the uh, computer so that it can count um, the number of times things are happening. That's really the main focus of using the Makey Makey. Uh, there's various equipment that will be made available to you for doing that. Your working groups and your tutors will help you through with that activity. Um, it doesn't have to be a human being. This one's a Pikachu Pokemon um, operation game. This one's an operation game and a whale. You can do it for a whole range of different um, things. So use your creativity in coming up with your own solution there. And there's a little video for you to watch that shows you how to create it and in particular connect it to the Scratch program. Now for online students, uh, of course I'm not making you go out and purchase Makey Makeys. Um, you're going to simulate the idea of it. So you're going to focus on creating the Scratch program. So I want you to think about how we could use a Makey Makey in a classroom to have various interactions in a classroom that we can tell the computer to do things. So the idea of this is so you could have it so that students could press some buttons um, and when they want to ask questions. So on their desks, they could have a little button, they could press that and then it would light up a or sound a buzzer next to the teacher, letting them know a student wants to ask a question. Or you could have it so that you could press different buttons and it will tell students to be quiet or to settle down or to pay attention um, on an overhead projector being projected through the Scratch program. So think about something that you could create in terms of an interactivity in a classroom where you could have various inputs into the computer and you're going to program the Scratch program to do something with those inputs um, as it relates to classroom life. So the last couple of things, in terms of extension readings, there is a, a little book on 
um, futures thinking that takes you through some more advanced concepts around futures thinking in the classroom. And also, oops. Oh, there's also one on um, systems thinking. And that's it for this week. So I look forward to seeing your creations in Microsoft Teams and in your work towards your assessment items. That's it for now.